Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're uh, we're going to call this meeting to order officially in about a minute or so, but yeah. we need some time for our um, technicians here to get the sound set up. I do remind you that this meeting tonight will be streamed live on Facebook and YouTube, and uh, it'll be available on YouTube for for vi uh, viewing at any time. So, uh, and I would ask you when you those that are going to speak tonight to please uh, speak into the microphone because we have folks at home that are watching and, and listening to the, uh, to the meeting tonight and uh, wanna make sure we have good sound and also then to register uh, so we have proper documentation in our uh, uh, minutes for our meeting tonight. So uh, uh, is there anything ready? you need me to do? Okay, good afternoon again to all of you that are present here in our audience tonight and for those of you that are uh, watching from home on YouTube or, or uh, Facebook, we thank you for uh, tuning in tonight, watching the proceeds. This is a uh, public hearing to, uh, for an appeal of a zoning decision regarding a uh, King's Ranch subdivision uh, up near Randleman near Level Cross. So, uh, that's the purpose of our meeting tonight, and uh, we're going to proceed, uh, as we mentioned, and please again speak directly into the mic as you're presenting tonight. And uh, with that, we will uh, ask Jay Dale, our planning and zoning administrator, to introduce the issue to our board and to the audience tonight. Thank you all again for, for your attendance. Yes, sir. Chairman Fry, members of the board, good evening. Uh, we're here tonight to hear the... Um, uh, appeal for the from the request of uh, uh, Richard Lee Petty uh, of the Kings Ranch subdivision. Um, it uh, it was appealed to the is to appeal the decision of the Randolph County Planning Board. They're rezoning five or they did rezone 518.88 acres. Uh, this located between Providence Church Road and Fred Limeberry Road in the Level Cross Township from RA Residential Agricultural to CVOECD, uh, conventional lot overlay exclusive uh, conditional district. This of course being site built homes. Uh, it was a secondary growth area. Uh, it would allow specifically 211 lot site built subdivision. Um, it's, I wanted to note at this point, while it is 518 acres, that 186 acres are left in open space. Uh, here's the uh, dot map showing the request location, the, the areas in yellow being the, uh, the proposed location of the subdivision. Uh, here we have the site plan. Um, if you look at it, it's a very well laid out site plan that was done by the Timmons Group. Um, you know, the planning department was, was pleased with the look of it. On the ground, it would actually look like several smaller subdivisions the way it's laid out rather than one you know, massive uh, grouped up thing and we thought that was was well done. It's probably one of the better design ones I've, I've seen in, in 20 plus years. Um, once again, the same uh, subdivision, but you can see the colored in areas that would uh, show the open space in green, uh, giving you a better idea of what you'd be looking at. Um, here we have the aerial photographs of the area. Uh, you can see the, um, the waterways that, that are skirting it. Dale, finally, I, yes, sir. go back to that. I, I hate to interrupt you. But no, it's not at all. Because we haven't got the questions yet, but there's a little strip that goes out to 220, business 220, right up there on the top left side of that map. Yes, sir. Is that an easement or a drive that attaches to 220 business? Um, is, is that going to be an entrance? No, there, there were a couple of places where we, we thought that they were going to access like that and they're actually gonna end the subdivision there and build berms not only so to show that they're not doing that but to create a physical barrier so if somebody decided hey I've got four wheel drive I'll just come in through this way you you really wouldn't be able to do that okay. um, and they they explained that at, at the, uh, the last hearing but but it was a, a genuine concern uh, other things that they they were concerned about uh, was the uh, excess on the school capacity in the area um, I've talked with Dr. Stephen Ganey. Actually, currently the schools are, are under capacity. So as he told me, you know, we, we need some kids. Um, that, that would be, you know, the opinion of, of, of the school board. Uh, traffic is always a concern. Uh, the numbers we have are ones that were um, 
produced by the DOT. Uh, they did do their best to use a formula that they thought would uh, account for the lower traffic due to COVID-19. You know, a lot of people pointed out, rightfully so, there's not as many people on the road right now. But they did at least put forth an effort to try and generate a number they thought would be more accurate on the traffic counts. So how many ingress and egress points are there? Or is that yet to be determined? Um, I think there's a couple, but I'll, I'll have to pull the map out to let you know for sure. Is it two? Okay, well then see, it is a couple, it's two, yes sir. Um, there were some concerns about diminished water table. I'm, I'm sure this board is familiar with the history of the area, but once again, the, you know, the Timmons group and, and their engineers did pretty extensive engineering studies to, to show how their water system would work and, and but the public be able water, to handle that. the public that. water is going to Victory Junction, right? There, there is a public water line that heads that way. They, they looked at tapping onto the line coming out of Randleman. Evidently, it became cost prohibitive to do so, but that, that was one of the first things they looked at. There will be a private water system going in. It's a series of wells. Um, they can probably explain it better than I can, but I understand basically they build a private water system that is then taken over by um, a private entity firm. I think Aqua Blue or something like that's the name of one of the ones I've seen sometimes in Randolph County that will maintain the system through the years and you know, basically sell the residents uh, the, the water. Um, they also did studies to uh, speak to any uh, runoff issues um, caused by the increase in impervious surface, with, which with a large subdivision, that's, that's always a concern. Uh, the planning department was pleased to see the amount of open space. That tends to help with uh, absorbing that and groundwater recharge. Um, as, as you know, the, the Randolph County Planning Board did, did pass this request, and um, that, that is an overview of the request, gentlemen. Aqua Blue, they have a system up in the Archdale area okay. off of Business 311. Okay. I, I knew I'd seen the, the, you know, the name, and there are some others that could possibly do it, but that's the one I could remember. I think that they bought some lines, I think, from the city of Arch or Archdale, bought some of their lines okay. down around Glenola. Okay. Did you, could you uh, expand a little bit on the impervious services areas today? <clears throat> Uh, when we talk about impervious surfaces, of course, we're talking about the roadways, driveways, the structures that would be out there, and, you know, and any time you create impervious surface run out, there's runoff, there's always concerns about uh, it not going into the water correctly, causing flooding issues is, is normally the, the, the biggest concern. Um, you know, once again, uh, uh, there's a considerable amount of this left in open space, which should help in absorbing that. They, they did studies on it that, that showed that it's, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, you know, they're not required to leave that amount of open space, but we're always pleased to see when they do. And, you, you know, they did it, and they weren't even looking to do what we would classify as an open space subdivision. It was just done to uh, increase the aesthetics of the, the development and deal with these, these matters with, with the water runoff. But you feel, you feel very comfortable about the impervious areas and uh, the way it's designed and I do. I, it, it certainly addresses it better than most of the subdivisions I see. Do you know if there'll be curbing and guttering? That I do not know. That that I'm sure they'll be happy to answer for you. But all the streets are built to state standards. <clears throat> yes, sir. They, they're required to be. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I might also add that information that I got. Um, the other day said that there's no need for a turning lane due to the NCDOT traffic count. Yes, but they have recommended a turning lane because I called DOT and they sent me a report and there is a recommended right turn lane. So, is that at the very good. Province Church or is mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the developer has to get the, the permits for the. Right. Yes, sir. For the streets. Yeah, the DOT has to be satisfied. Right. <laughs> yes, they have to say. Both, is it off of both entrances or just the front? Uh, there, there's one off of, there is, and, and they'll have to, you know, the engineers, they'll have to, you know, clarify this for us because their, their recommended laneage is coming, coming, like from our map, coming, coming from, um, 
220. From the further, no, coming, coming from 220, yeah. there is an, an NCDOT recommended turnoff, right turnoff. On I Providence mean, Grove? Yes, on Providence oh, I mean, Grove. Providence Church Grove. Church. Coming from the <clears throat> other direction, there is a recommended left turn lane going in. So it's not DOT required, but it's recommended. And then on the other side of the development on uh, Fred Lineberry, there's a recommended recommended left turn lane. Not a required turn off lane, but a recommended left turn lane. Oh, okay. And then recommended turn lanes exiting the development right. on both sides for right and left. Oh, okay. So behind it. Mm -hmm. Other questions, uh, uh, Jay? All right. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, sir. All right. We will open the public hearing portion of our meeting tonight for you, the public, and we will ask for the first speaker. And please identify yourself so we know who's speaking and then uh, register and Thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Amanda you, Hodierne. I'm you can remove your mask while you speak okay, if you like. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh. <laughs> I can breathe a little easier. My name is Amanda Hodierne. I'm the attorney and representative um, for the applicant, Diamondback Investment Group. My offices are at 804 Green Valley Road in Greensboro, 27408. Uh, my client uh, is the contract purchaser of this property and the would-be developer um, should we be able to obtain the approvals here this evening. Diamondback Investment Group is a residential-only developer. Uh, they work all over the state, and their preferred type of project is like the one before you this evening, single-family uh, subdivisions. I have with me here tonight Brandon Horn from Diamondback. He's the project manager um, that would facilitate this project, and he's available for questions. We also have Jim Chandler from Timmins Engineering Group. Um, you guys were getting into some of those technical aspects earlier, so he's here to help us with those um, types of questions. And I believe we've got our traffic engineer on the way who's supposed to be here, so um, hopefully we'll have that resource at our disposal this evening as well. That, that study was also performed by Timmins. As you've heard uh, from Mr. Dale, this rezoning request is for 518 acres over that actually, currently zoned residential agriculture. We've requested the conventional subdivision overlay exclusive conditional district. And um, a, an easier way to say that is the subdivision before you tonight is the condition of our application. So that proposal um, as it's laid out, as we discuss here tonight, is the only thing that we would be allowed to do. And if any deviation occurred that was less intense as we go through the technical review process, um, for instance, if some of the soils weren't suitable to perk for septic and we had to lose a few lots, then that's just the way it is. Um, alternatively, if for some reason something changed and we wanted to add lots or make it more intense, we would not be able to do that without coming back before this process through your planning department and through your um, planning and zoning board, planning board to get approvals for that. So this, this site plan we're talking about tonight is specific. Uh, turning now to that plan, if we could pull up the exhibit, please. If so, Just tell me uh, do you have the one that, yeah, that's perfect, thank you. Uh, this color-coded version makes it a little easier to talk, talk from. Uh, we worked with your staff and the parameters of your development code to come up with a design that we believe is a good steward of this particular piece of property. It protects the significant natural resources on this site and um, also works to be harmonious with the surrounding area. Looking at the exhibit here, you can see our two basic starting points were the olive green areas, which are to be reserved by the property owner. So obviously those could not be a part of our design. And then of course the significant uh, environmental features that, that traverse the site. There's multiple locations of this predominant stream network and it creates these fingers all into the site that create little enclaves of area. 
and that, that really dictated the design here and ended up with this, um, with this layout that Mr. Dale spoke about that really isn't just a 211 lot subdivision all platted out in a row. It's, it's actually four to five different little enclaves that will function um, like, like separate subdivisions for all intents and purposes. We also worked hard to, um, as mentioned, preserve a significant amount of open space on this site. 35.8%, in fact, is in open space. Um, that, that's a big amount um, by, by any definition, but it's especially a large amount when you're already dealing with relatively large lots. For a subdivision, um, acre lots are, are pretty generous, and in this, this particular layout, our average lot size is actually over an acre. So to have an acre lot and, you know, almost 36% of your subdivision be open space um, w works out to a, a very low density design and something that we hope is aesthetically pleasing and in keeping with, um, with your county. By the numbers, um, our quantitative data supports the description, I think. Um, we're proposing just 211 lots on 519 acres. 183.2 acres are slated for that open space. The minimum lot size is 40,000 square feet, but our average lot size is over 51,000 square feet. Um, a couple of nice design features that I think work well here. There's three acres of open space right at the entrance to this subdivision down on Fred Lineberry Road. You can see that green pocket. Um, this is a a very impactful, a high impact little um, cluster of open space because what it does is it works to set the, the beginning of the subdivision off from the road. So as you're traveling down Fred Lineberry, you're not even gonna see the beginning of those homes there because it's tucked away behind that open space off the road. The common property lines that we share with existing subdivisions all feature meaningful open space and separation as well. So we're not platting our lots right up to the, to the boundary of this property. Um, and we're, we're keeping our existing single family subdivision um, neighbors, you know, appropriately buffered even from a like and compatible use like this one. Um, due to these design features, I would submit to you that this proposal does meet the call of your adopted growth management plan, which asks you to create innovative subdivisions that facilitate the safeguarding of existing natural resources and protect the existing rural neighborhoods through compatible and high quality new residential development. Looking at a few technical aspects of our plan, we have completed a TIA, a traffic impact analysis. It's required as part of your process and it does get uh, reviewed and commented upon and enforced by the uh, NCDOT as you guys have mentioned. That final report at this point, um, it was still under review when we were at planning board, but at this point it's been finalized, it's been approved and as mentioned by Commissioner Haywood, it did um, require some turn lanes that bef before we, we didn't know what they were gonna require, but they have recommended and required certain turn lanes. Um, I know Providence, Re Providence Church Road is gonna require a decel lane or a right-hand storage turn lane of 100 feet com coming into the entrance there. Of course, the left-hand turn lanes will be required as well. Um, my understanding is that they were required Commissioner Haywood, and, and we can drill down onto that, but our, our expectation is that those will need to be built. So that, that's what the developer will do. What is your minimum square footage? Of the lots? No, for the houses. For the houses. Uh, the minimum square footage for the house in our declaration as it's proposed right now, I believe we have it at 1,700 to eight, or 1,800 square feet, um, and it would go all the way up to over 3,000 square feet. The intent say, say that again. It starts at 1,700 square feet and it goes all the way up to over 3,000. Uh, the intention being to um, facilitate and encourage a, a broad range of floor plans that would have different sizing and um, you know one story, two story, different types of options um, so that the, the neighborhood can have some, some nice variation in it. Uh, you guys talked about drainage and, and stormwater quality. This site is actually in a, in a watershed area, and due to that, we have to, we have to meet a higher bar for those, for those stormwater requirements. Um, the way we've done that here is we've gone with what's called a low-density development option. 
And the way we're able to achieve that is with, of course, the larger lots, but most importantly, with the significant amount of open space. So that, that allows us to meet that threshold and that open space is part of that calculation um, under that state design manual because it does allow for the better, the better um, infiltration off the impervious surface and, and the recharge. Um, it also does not include curb and gutter on the streets. That's a component of that low density development option. So these streets will be built to state standards, will be dedicated um, and, and accepted by NCDOT, but won't have curb and gutter. The lots will all be served by septic system. Uh, the proposal we have before us has had the soils evaluated in preliminary fashion so that we can do a, a feasible layout. But of course, um, once, once we're past this entitlement phase and actually looking at construction drawings, the county health department will have to come out and test and review all of our, all of our septic field proposed locations. And if, as I mentioned earlier, if something doesn't work, we'll have to move it or let it go because um, they get the final say in that. We're also proposing a community well system here. You can see the proposed well sites on the full site plan in your packet. Uh, if we're able to move forward in this project, once we get to the platting phase, we'll go through the process to site and locate and test those wells on, on those locations. Based on the number of lots we have, we actually probably only need um, about three well sites. We've proposed five, just in case it gives us some, um, some backup options in case some of those sites don't work out, but we, we won't utilize all five. Just, just to clarify, the well sites are those little circles? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Um, when we appeared before the planning board with this case, we discussed the water table at length and discussed the use of the wells. And I had brought, I had brought some material from Guilford County that they use um, with, with high flow well proposals. It's an additional layer of study that they require for the uh, intake and, and testing of those proposed wells. And we offered, uh, the developer offered voluntarily to undertake that, that study and extra level of rigor for the wells on this site. And uh, the, the planning board thought that was a good idea, I think, and, and added it as a condition of our approval, which we were amenable to and accepted. So that, that's still something that we would, of course, adhere to and, and go forward with. And um, that, that Guilford County model provides us with a nice, I think, um, roadmap of a way to scrutinize that uh, more. And we can, we can certainly do that. Um, in the packet that we submitted with this to your planning staff, we did include also a proposed draft of the HOA declaration. It um, speaks to things like the architectural standards um, and also you know, rules and regulations for the project. It was brought to our attention at planning board that there were some language in there requiring irrigation and, and lawn watering that exacerbated the concerns about the water table and the wells, so we agreed to remove that. So um, when we move forward, if we're able to do so and we submit our whole package with the declaration, that language won't be included because we're certainly amenable to that, to that request. Is that a set of bylaws that you've used at other, other developments? Yes, sir. It's 58 pages. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> we try to, be, try to be thorough and then we try to go back once we get through this process and work, work with the individual community that we're in, we, we go back and tailor it to meet um, you know, whatever inequities might exist in a certain project. But yes. Do you have any other developments in Randolph County? No, sir, not, not this client, not in, I think that's right. Not in Randolph County. But Guilford and Greensboro. Yes, sir, Greensboro, Forsyth, um, Wake County, let's see. East, New Hanover, in the Charlotte region as well. Um, we, did, we did cover a few of those technical aspects in a lot more detail at Planning Board. We can certainly do that here tonight, but I don't want to be redundant um, if, if you've been over that material in your package. So I will um, I'll open it up to questions. Like I said, we've got our team here, and we can um, delve into to different aspects as you like. But... Um, that, that's the overview, and we're here and available as the conversation continues. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of the presenter? As I was reading through the, uh, all of the declarations, articles, and whatnot, it talks about the declarant is, is listed Shiloh Church 157 LLC, and then there's another reference to Providence Church 170 LLC. Is that a typo? or? That's, yes, sir. Um, as your chairman mentioned, I, ha I have that form and I failed to c change the, the name in one place. Yep. 
So I'll have to fix that on the final yeah. edit. Thank you. I, I was getting, yeah. I thought that's what it was, but I was getting confused. Yeah. And, and 58 pages later, or however much it was, <laughs> it was it became clear. So. I, need, I need your help on the front end, I think. <laughs> Other questions? I, I don't know who to ask this of. You know, maybe you, maybe some of the others, but um, there's a cell tower back in there. Mm -hmm. Is it on? Is it on this property? It is not. Is is that correct, Jim? Yeah, it, it butts right up to the property, but it's not. That's, that's what I thought. It's it's adjacent, but not on this property. Okay. All right. Well, that then that segues into another question. I know that there are two families that have large tracts of land that are, you know, adjoin this or are in it, which would open up the possibility, according to discussions I've had, for about another 100 acres possibly to be purchased and developed. Um, What can you tell me about that? About that? I mean, I'm familiar I know it's with big what if, but sure. I'm, I know I'm familiar with with the Oxendine property. I'm not sure the other one that you're alluding to, but yes, certainly there are, are tracks around here. Um, but because they're not part of this proposal, and we don't have them under contract right now, they're not currently being evaluated, or you know, that we've not slated them for this development. So um, if if that were to happen in the future then we'd have to go back through the process and either amend or, or tack on to this, this project and come back um, here before, before the county to get those approvals. So as of right now, that's not something we could just, you know, flip a switch and change. And, and conversely, even if it wasn't my, my client, if it was another developer, that developer would also have to sure. go through the process. Sure. And so What is, um, and I should know this, I, I was told, but I've forgotten. What's the maximum number of houses that you can, uh, that you're approved for? There's some leeway, you, you already referenced that on either side. Well, what's that maximum? It, it's 211, as okay. you see here. That we, there's leeway to, to be less intense, do less lots, right. but, but not, you to, can't not to do exceed. more than 211. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You could sell two lots to the same person. Yes, sir, our, our declaration would control that and we don't have a prohibition on that. Um, right. I will tell you, our, our plan is, is you know one house per lot, but certainly I guess that could be well, something. You, you mentioned 3,000 square foot houses, they, they might wanna buy two lots. They, yeah, absolutely. Could. Yeah. And that would reduce the number of houses. It would. Is that pretty much generally your experience? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was like, well, I'll try this again. <laughs> uh, is that generally your experience that you have some of those two lot purchases or, or people splitting lots or this type of thing? We wouldn't allow the splitting of a lot. That, that's something the declaration does prohibit because that would create more density and it would, it would make an unbuildable lot under your development ordinance. Um, keeping two lots, you know, I think that that's is largely gonna be driven practically just by the economics and, and the builder team. If, you know, because if a builder evaluates this and does a pro forma, of course, and if they need to sell X, you know, if they need to sell X number of lots and build X number of homes to make it work for them, you know, that, that might be the consideration to make them say, well, if I build, if I sell it to you, then I'm not gonna build a home on it. So, you know, I don't know how a builder would make those economics work, but, you know, in other cases, you, you get in and maybe the vol velocity slows or it's not doing what you think it's gonna do and you have people who want that model and if that starts working better, I have seen it change um, midstream like that if a market kind of starts to lead it in a different direction. So do you know at this point in time if, um if all the homes will be built by the same builders? Is it one of these things where you've got several different house plans, people choose from the house plans, does each person use their own builder? We're evaluating those options. We um, just kind of a, a little bit of sequencing on our side. It, 
we can't really get a builder engaged until we have an entitled site plan because they don't know what they're agreeing to, of course, and they don't know if it's going to work for them. So at this point, it's, it's just a lot of, you know, talking to various prospects. Some of those prospects, you know, a 211 lot subdivision is something that some single builders can handle. Um, but some of those prospects would be, would be a team, you know, a, a team of builders. But even if we did a, a one builder situation, um, what, what we have found in our subdivisions is that it, it's not good for it's not good for the velocity of the neighborhood and the sales if you just kind of have a, you know, come into the model home and select sure. A, B, C, or D. So that that's not um, the type of package that we put together with any of our end users. Um, we, we do like to have a considerable amount of variety to where you'll have houses on the street that have different front facades, have different treatment of building materials, you know, one stories and two stories all on the same street. And it just, um, it tends to, tends to make a better community for everyone. Absolutely. And that's why I asked the question. Yes, I want to know are, what we're looking at. You yes, know. you are correct. And that's why we try to make our declaration, you know, 1,700 to 3,000 is a huge, is a huge expanse, but that's the reason, because we want it to, we want it to be flexible. Right, right, right. And so I'm trying to, I'm that visual person, so I'm trying to visualize, I assume from the range in mm -hmm. sizes that there would be different plans, but I also know that there are those communities, um, I'll speak to like Chapel Hill where you've got, um, you know, Southern Village and you've got Metamont, and so you have all those different types of things mm -hmm. in one space. Um, you actually you know. raise a really good point. Th those communities are, are more of a traditional neighborhood development type design where a lot of the focus is on that massing of the streetscape. You know, you look down the street and you see the front porches and the, and the steps and the stoop all the way down and it's very cutesy and it's pulled up to the street. Um, in a neighborhood like this with one acre lots, you're not gonna get that effect because there's, um, I'm sure Mr. Dale can tell us the front setbacks, but you're gonna have room to move the building envelope more. So you're gonna get more variation in where the house is on the lot and also what kind of house you can build on the lot. Thank Cause you. you're not gonna have such a tiny building envelope. Um, and also with the with the no, no curb and gutter, you know, it doesn't really create that real pulled up to the street kind of massing effect. Yep. Okay. But if there's no curb and gutter, and then there won't be sidewalks either. Sometimes there is. Then this one, I don't, I don't believe so. No. And that again is is kind of part of that trade off to keep that impervious surface down. Sure. Sure. I'm, like I said, I, I'm getting the picture of what yes, we're voting on. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, wait, I do have another one. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Trees. So, uh, I mean, I've been around the property, and I've, there are some really areas that are heavily wooded, beautiful trees. There are some others that are not. So is the plan to, to clear cut all that, to leave trees where you can? What is yes, ma'am. It's it's the latter, and you can kind of tell just from the practicality of the way this site is. We're going to have to go in and kind of strategically access each of those areas because we can't touch anything within the open space. Okay. So in addition to so maybe trees in the green spaces. Absolutely, and okay. and you know we try to leave more than that. We we don't just go in and pancake sure. everything else, but on this site, um, the open space is significant and it's dispersed nicely. So it, it's going to force a more, you know, surgical approach to to the grading and clearing plan, because you just you literally can't connect all those areas um, without saving the trees that we need to save. Okay. And the nice thing about the stream corridors, when when you kind of start with that as your guiding principle, is that's where all your nice hardwoods are. Typically, not always, not all of them, but that's where your most dense nice hardwood areas are. So those, um, <clears throat> it's a nice double, you know, um, double feature of protecting those corridors. And you did say, kind of backing up into your comments, that the, all the long discussion in the planning zoning meeting about the deep well concern and everything and the irrigation part, mm -hmm. that is, you, you have taken that out? You're going to take that out? Is that yes, we haven't submitted an, a different draft yet, you know, but when we do at the end of this process and should we move on to the next phase, then yes, our new draft would fix my typos and also remove that language that um, we, we said we would remove. Mm -hmm. 
Other questions? Well, I have to ask one more. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Will there by any chance be any trails in there? Yes, we hope so. We um, have to keep zone one of the buffer, which is the interior 25 feet closest to the stream banks. We have to keep that completely undisturbed. But outside of that, um, this, this will be usable open space for the residents. So it, it's not something that everybody has to stay out of that's gonna be you know, roped off or anything. In fact, in the declaration, there's an easement granted to the use of the HOA and its residents for, um, for the, the use of all this stuff. So certainly if, if um, you know, as part of our development process, I, I suppose we could actually build a trail, but a lot of times you, know, you, you want the more low impact type of style um, that tends to evolve over time as people cut, cut their paths through the woods to a friend's house or to, um, you know, to, to meet up with a different road system or, or whatever. But yes, that would always be usable and, and available. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else who wishes to speak in favor or for or comments on the development? All right, those that are uh, opposed or part of the appeal tonight, we'll ask you who's first. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tanya Hayes, um, and I am. Just, I appreciate the additional clarification that we received from um, Diamondbacks representative, um, Ms. Hodiern, this evening. But I do have some additional traffic concerns, or just some additional questions about the traffic that I'm hoping we can get some clarification around. Um, so the original traffic study numbers show more traffic on Providence Church Road than it actually does on U.S. Business Highway 220. And that seems a little odd, um, I think. And again, I'm no expert when it comes to, to traffic. Um, but in my mind, it seems odd that a secondary road would have more traffic than a primary road. Um, in addition, the study does not provide any statistics at all for Fred Limeberry Road, unless I'm missing something on this. Um, it only, the traffic analysis impact only shows um, Highway 220 business and Providence Church Road. So there's nothing really on here about Fred Limeberry Road. Um, and we know that that's going to be a main entrance um, off of Fred Limeberry Road also. Um, I, I do appreciate the clarification about the formula that was used um, to take into consideration the fact that we were in the, uh, probably the early phases of COVID when this uh, study was completed. I, I didn't see a date on here, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, but obviously, in the midst of our pandemic, that would have uh, impacted those numbers uh, for that study. Uh, I also find it interesting that the traffic assessment for the local sh schools show that NERMS, excuse me, I'm a NERMS mom, so if you don't know what NERMS is, that's... We know what NERMS, <laughs> we know what NERMS is. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and uh, can I just say PG then? Well, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, and um, PG are already congested, but I find it interesting that this assessment lists level cross as good when currently um, parents are lining both shoulders of the road in the morning and in the afternoon waiting um, to be able to, to turn in to pick up and drop off their children. 
And um, we actually have some photos, if you'd like to, to see these, that were taken just this past week around 2.30 um, that shows cars lining both sides, cars on the wrong side of the road, buses having to go around cars on the wrong side of the road. Um, and again, I'm happy to, to share those with you if you would like to see, um, but we do have some, some photos of that. Um, and I would just emphasize again that these photos were taken um, recently, and schools are not at 100% attendance right now. Um, we know that there are some parents that are, are their kids are uh, continuing to learn remotely all the time, and then um, there are parents, there's, my understanding is, now both of mine have, are, have graduated, but um, there's a rotation attendance going on. So, um, you know, it's congested um, and confusing as the traffic is right now around that school. Um, when schools are back to 100%, there could be additional impact um, of traffic, um, especially if we have a 210 homes going in that area with additional students as well. Um, So the, I did have some additional concerns regarding the proposed development entrances. I appreciate hearing the, um, the information about the, the um, turn lanes. I may not be using the exact correct terminology, um, but the, the left turn lane, the right turn lane, they're on uh, Providence Church Road. Um, but again, the entrance on Fred Lineberry is going to be a main entrance as well, right beside an entrance to Victory Junction and across from three existing driveways on the opposite side um, where there, and in this area there is also a hill um, and a blind curve. I personally, personally have had close calls in that area. Um, both of these roads are narrow two-lane roads that provide cut through traffic from, uh, for a lot of folks to either Business 220, Greensboro, or Randleman. Um, I, I also think it's important to mention the traffic circle um, at Business 220 and Providence Church Road if you haven't had the um, pleasure yet of trying to maneuver through that. Um, apparently it continues to be an issue for numerous people, um, drivers who consistently blow through the um, that's a technical term, by the way, who constantly blow through that circle, um, as is evident by the number of times the yield sign has been hit. It, it is consistently um, having to be replaced. I would personally be curious to know um, what the number of times there's been an, an accident at that circle and would imagine additional traffic in the area would, um, would be added calls for concern there as well. Um, you know, I. I have no doubt, and I'm sure you don't either, that Diamondback has the financial and engineering resources to create a safer plan for the community as it relates to traffic, and I appreciate hearing some of, of what they have currently planned. Creating left turn lanes, uh, clear sight lines, um, and, and other enhancements obviously will go a long way in helping ensure safety for those of us that are currently living in the community as well as our, our, our future neighbors at Diamondback. Um, however, keep in mind that these plans will also come at a cost to existing home and landowners when they lose property to um, accommodate these safety measures. Um, you know, the community and future neighbors of King's Ranch development are open and we are receptive to working with the developer to create a better plan for our community our neighbors, um, and for the development um, company as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Hayes. <clears throat> Do I continue? <clears throat> Next. So, 
Dale Bean, 5205 Fred Lineberry Road, uh, Randleman, North Carolina. Uh, so thank you guys for the opportunity to come in and actually have an opportunity to talk about the concerns of the proposal and the development itself. Um, I'll start with obviously what we've already talked about a little bit around the community well system in, in and of itself. Uh, and in reviewing the development proposal, I find it interesting that three of the wells are all within 400 feet of each other uh, as their site design is. And then the other two wells are within 150 feet of each other. Uh, and I have uh, snipped that out for you guys if you guys are interested in seeing that. Uh, but if you look on the proposal uh, there, they're literally stacked on top of each other. Uh, knowing that uh, and knowing uh, a little bit about wells myself, uh, we're talking about a fractured rock aquifer here, right? We're not talking about uh, any other aquifers in the area uh, in and to itself. Uh, and what we know about rock, fractured rock aquifers is, is once you penetrate those, you could be imposing on your neighbors, right? Because it's all underneath water. It's a, it, we don't know where those aquifers end and start. Uh, so as we look at this, uh, you know, and these, these being close together and in a community of this size, uh, that's just concerning uh, in and of itself to me. Uh, I've also talked uh, around in the neighborhood, uh, and I think you could probably go around the, the room here and know that uh, in recent events here, uh, we've had situations where it's taking now multiple times to drill a well uh, before we actually get an established well uh, on property there in and of itself. Um, you know, the other pieces of this that concern me is the use of water uh, to a lot of people, I don't think we realize what wells are and what public water separations are. Uh, we, a lot of people think they go to the spigot, they turn on the spigot, and we're going to get water just like we go to the light switch, we turn on the light switch, we expect electricity. Uh, however, the vastly difference in the well is that usually there's no meter usage, right? Uh, so in looking through all the documentations that I could find, um, I don't see any indications of metered usage here or any billable solution back to the homeowner in and of itself. Uh, and that concerns me because if there's not any financial penalty for using a gallon of water, people are not going to be responsible for using what is going to be a well system that is going to be in our neighborhood and drawing from water that could be impacting our neighbors in and of itself. Uh, you know, and that meaning things like, I know we talked about they're going to say they're not going to require the watering of lawns, but that doesn't mean that the neighbor can't go out and water their lawn, or that the neighbors can't go out and dig themselves swimming pools and decide that they all want to fill their swimming pool up the first week of May, and we're all scratching our heads saying, where's our water at? Uh, you know, hearing the cost and, 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 and confusion there for me around hooking into public water is, uh, they were adamant in their development at the Planning and Zoning Board that their backup plan is to be able to connect to public water if they have issues with their wells. So if you're building a water system that is to the standards to be able to be connected to a public water system, how is the cost of digging five wells going to be more expensive or less expensive than being able to connect to a public water system that is already right there in the backyard of their neighborhood and the vast majority of the houses that they will be able to hook to. Not only is it a public water system there as far as water, there's also sewer system there too. So that gives them the opportunity to avoid the septic system in and of itself too. So uh, the other concerns that I have around a community well is I think Hope, Ms. Haywood, you uh, brought that forward, is the growth plan. So if there is a growth plan, what is the growth plan going to be when it comes to uh, eventual developments? Are we going to allow additional housing to be uh, connected to this community well system in the neighborhood? Or are we going to, how are we going to address to those situations? Um, so those are kind of my concerns in, in, the, in and of above the water concerns in itself. The second concern that I have is still around the environmental impact to the area. Uh, and we talk about the increase in stormwater runoff, and we've all heard tonight that stormwater runoff is part of a development. Uh, and I realize that developers are held to state laws in these developments, uh, and they do have a lot of open space uh, in, I'll say, some areas, uh, and in not some areas of the development in and of itself. Um, myself, uh, I am a landowner that adjoins this piece of property, uh, and we have a family farm that actually butts up to this property. 
uh, and that farm is directly connected. Uh, and we've already seen an increase in the stormwater runoff uh, due to the clear cutting of the property that's around there. Uh, and I have pictures uh, here again, I can submit those to you guys to look at, uh, along with a snippet of where this actually was taken at, uh, if you look at this. Uh, and on the screen there, it will be the bottom left quadrant uh, of that, the big yellow strip, uh, with the cul-de-sac down at the bottom in and of itself. Uh, that actually starting somewhere around lot 67 and 80 begins a downhill flow uh, towards the uh, farm that we own. Uh, and when you get to the bottom of that, what you're gonna see is it's formed a creek uh, that is now actually flowing into our property and flowing into the two and a half acre pond that we have on the property in and of itself that is not called out as a creek or a stream on this map at all. So again, my concern around that is you know, we've worked closely uh, with the soil and water community to build, uh, you know, conservation plans. Uh, that land is actually in the voluntary agriculture district as we speak. Uh, and, and so we are using that land as farmland. So chemical runoff, uh, increased sedimentation into the creeks and streams obviously lead to concerns when you're talking about farming and how you preserve uh, your farmland in and of itself. Uh, what we see actually on that left too is the fact that that property uh, and that quadrant is a full clear cut. Uh, so we go back to the buffer questions that you guys had. Uh, obviously they're talking about leaving trees in the greenways in and of itself, uh, but we do not have any buffer at all there to help slow down any of the runoff uh, that would be coming from this area. Uh, so that again, with a rolling landscape and actually a roll downhill uh, from those lots down uh, would be a major concern for me uh, as we move forward. Um, we've talked about septic tanks. They talked about the minimum lot sizes, those types of things. Uh, septic tanks can lead to trouble in the futures, uh, especially when you've got uh, smaller lot size. I know they're, they're saying acres, but we do have some smaller lot size that they're talking about here. Uh, so my concern there again is being in a watershed, which is the Polecat Creek watershed uh, and, you know, labeled as a water supply three critical level uh, for that watershed is, is again a concerning area. Um, I have concerns just like the lady before me spoke around the traffic volume. I think it's important that we really look at those pictures from the elementary school and understand that that is a dangerous situation as we speak now. Uh, and if we're talking adding additional housing there, uh, we are talking the increase for more issues and more concerns there. Um, Another area of concern that I have around this uh, is the, again, the size of the lots in comparison to the average acreage uh, around the area. Um, the impact analysis, if you look through that, shows that the acreage is around four plus acres, uh, while it seems to admit uh, the acreage on Fred Lineberry Road, which would actually, I think, drive that acreage uh, up in size in and of itself. Um, while they are reserving the open space for the lot, uh, the lot sizes are still in my opinion, especially in the Fred Lineberry Roadside, very stacked together and very de developmental uh, compared to the other areas of the map if you look at this. Uh, so again, I think buffers would help to alleviate some of that uh, concern there in those areas. Um, I'm trying, the, uh, also, if we look at the area around uh, what is Victory Junction Gang Camp uh, and in the snippets, oh, sorry, the snippets of the property there, uh, there is already a rural growth area uh, which would consume lots one, one through uh, nine and wrap around. Uh, and a rural growth area, from my understanding and doing my own research, says that that has to be three acre lots uh, and not just the minimum of the lot sizes that you guys have today. Uh, proposed. So uh, that would be a question and concern that I have in and of itself. Um, so, you know, I think for me, uh, the larger lot size, I know why they're saying they're, sa they're saving open spaces. Uh, I do think larger lot sizes would lead to less congestion in the area and also would lead to less concerns uh, around the area in and of itself. Um, I'm glad to hear that there is uh, some square footage requirements there. Uh, because I do know that this developer has been known uh, and is in the current process of trying to come in and do something very similar to this in the Jamestown area. 
Uh, and it, you know, this is, it is a non-conventional situation there. Uh, and the, I know Jamestown is, is reviewing that at this point in time. So, uh, you know, that is a concerning situation there because, uh, you know, a, a minimum house size obviously drives the environment that you're trying to produce uh, in an environment like this. So uh, that was of, of concern and, and hoping that we can make uh, recommendations on uh, square footage for houses from the board uh, to make sure this development doesn't fall into that trap. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, my last piece of this is, right, as a county and a community, uh, we've been very proud to support Victory Junction Gang Camp and the benefits that that camp has brought to our area and the acknowledgement that that camp has brought to our area. Uh, and one of the reasons being, and we talked about that just a few minutes ago, is the fact that it's in a rural growth area. Uh, and it's in a rural setting, and it was put in place there around the camp so that the campers could come and be able to enjoy the camp as a rural camp. Uh, and as a county, I would ask you guys, do we want to take and see one of our largest advertised attractions and the camping atmosphere that's provided be surrounded by a subdivision that's now gonna be 211 houses around the camp. You know, I think there always will be a need for economic impact and development. However, I feel it's also important to make sure that that economic impact and development is not creating a burden on the natural resources or an existing property owner in the rural area. I feel that the modifications of possibly looking at making uh, a recommendation for public water I think in looking at possibility of creating lot sizes maybe a little larger to where we're not in a stack situation uh, in, in a lot of those areas. And then obviously providing buffer uh, in those areas where there has been clear cutting already taking place around the development. Uh, I think this area could actually see growth but also maintain the rural presence that we've all been able to enjoy for the last few decades that we've had there. So I thank you guys for your consideration and your time, and thank you. Thank you. Ready? Thank you. My name is Stephen Stanley, and I live at 6048 Racine Road. And where we live is a short little strip of straightaway road, and, and it's right at the crossroads of Providence Church. Well, you know, during the day, there's a lot of activity because, you know, it, uh, there's a lot of uh, school bus activity, you know, going down to the new schools there. So in the mornings and in the afternoons, the traffic is very heavy. And so a lot of times, see, I'm retired, so I'm at home every day, basically. And you can always tell between, say, uh, 6.30 and, say, 8.30, the traffic is big. And then the same way when, say, maybe 3 o'clock to maybe 5 o'clock, the traffic is heavy. And also, that is also a place where a lot of emergency vehicles come, in, come to cut across to, to get to the hospitals, you know, we see them all the time. Well, you know, if you did a study on that road, you know, say maybe 20 hours out of the day, the traffic's not that much. But in those certain times, the traffic is huge. And if you add a lot of, uh, if you add more to it, then it's gonna be dangerous. And the roads, you know, the, the way they were designed, you know, from years back, the same way with Fred Lineberry, they're very crooked. And the speed limit is 35 out where we are down to the creek there, but nobody, uh, nobody obeys it. And it's, it's scary to pull out of your driveway at times. And so, like I said, with Fred Lineberry, it is so crooked that, you know, it was just, they paved, say, an old country road, so there's, there, there's no straightaway to it. And, uh, you know, an, another thing, too, what, what the gentleman was talking about, uh, the water, 
you know, I'm sure as, all, as you all remember, back, I think it was 08 to 09, we had that enormous drought. You remember it well. And uh, I remember a friend of mine that from work, his property, he lived in, you know, the edge of Guilford County right there on the line, and Polecat Creek ran behind his house. And one afternoon, he and I walked up the creek bed of Polecat Creek. It was completely dry. And he said he'd lived there all his life, and that had never happened. Now, I know that was kind of an incident that, you know, it may never happen again, but you never know. And I remember where we live, you know, we, we conserved water. We didn't wash cars and do a lot of extra water in it all. But the thing that worries me about these uh, wells is, you know, these people, it's like they're on city water. You know, they, you know, they have, you know, they don't worry about running out of water. So, you know, when their flowers start to wilt or their grass starts to die, they could overwater and not, uh, not, you know, consider that, well, you know, I shouldn't be using this water because it could pull my well down. And with these wells being so deep, how do you know the effect of the distance on either side that uh, this affects when the water level goes down. And uh, I was a plumber all my life, along with my father, and I remember an incident. It was uh, in Guilford County where this man, you know, called us, and we did well work, you know, just residential, and he called and he said he didn't have any water. So we went over to his house, you know, and and uh, we pulled the top off as well, you know, and we took a string and tied a, a, a fitting to it, and we lowered it down the well, and we, when we heard it say plunk, we tied a little knot there. That, that meant the top of the water, and then we were gonna measure down to the bottom. So we tied the little knot, laid it down, it went about three foot and stopped. And so we're like, wow, you got three foot of water. Well, they had built a, uh, a, 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 some uh, houses behind him, and he found out what happened. They had, when they drilled their well, which was deeper than his, they drained his, so he ended up with no water. Well, I know that's maybe a, just an incident, but that's what's scary about when you start drilling super deep wells. And like you say, if we have, if we have a time when the, when the water gets a little bit sparse, I mean, I know I've seen, uh, Randall Lake get way down and you know some of the, I got some on Providence Church there's some lakes around the house that I've seen them way down so the last few years we've had an abundance of water and on up to now you know we've had an abundance of water so I don't see how you could figure how much uh, water you could have because this is a, this is a really a time to where there's more water than you can use and see, that is my point. I, I, I live, you know, maybe a mile and a half from where they're going to drill the wells, but still, I don't know what the effect could be if we have an extended dry spell. But, uh, you know, and, but, you know, another thing, too, go, going back to where the roads are, you know, it's, it's, it's scary when you pull out of your driveway and, and, you know, that you don't know if somebody's coming around the curve very fast. And like I said, I don't see how they could widen any of these roads because, you know, they would take away our yards. And also a lot of this land slopes down from the road down to whatever, and there's just no more room. And, uh, you know, I would just, I mean, I know you have to have, uh, you know, people need places to live and all, but it's kind of scary to when you start, you know, you take an area and you just put a lot of houses in there and then maybe in the future you add some more. So, you know, I would just, like I said, I don't want to stop progress, but I'm just afraid that progress is going to make it difficult for, for the people in that area to live. And most of us have been there 30 or more years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Get her, I'll come back here. Hi, my name is Amy Koval. I live at 6013 Fred Lineberry Road. And um, 
also just want to say thank you um, for hearing the concerns um, that the community has tonight and um, just kind of want to reiterate what some of the others have said you know we're we're all for the growth as long as it's done responsibly um, we do have some major concerns uh, for the area um, one of those being the compatibility of this this development with the surrounding area um, as I believe Dale mentioned before the average acreage within a mile is over four acres and um, in these 211 lots actually the one through six that Dale mentioned as part of the rural growth area I believe those are actually reserved for Victory Junction Gang and those are actually six of the largest lots um, so once those are taken out, the, the ones that will be available, you know, as the actual subdivision um, are a little smaller, so it, it skews the average a little bit. But um, out of the 205 lots, um, not including those for Victory Junction, um, there's 71 lots that are less than one acre. There's 30 lots that are the bare minimum. Um, the 40,000 square feet or it's like 0.92 acres and um, there's 175 of the lots that are less than one and a half acres and 195 that are less than two acres which is less than half of the surrounding average so the there is open space though which is definitely appreciated but um, the the density is is a little more than what we have surrounding the area. Um, and, and that's also, we know that, that housing preferences have changed, large land plots maybe aren't as desirable as they once were, but um, given the nature of the surrounding areas, um, a little bit larger lots or the opportunity for people to purchase mul um, multiple lots, at one point I believe that was um, not going to be allowed, but maybe it will now. Um, that would help lessen the impact on our community, um, which, as you've already heard, the two major um, impacts on our community are traffic and water. Um, starting with the water, um, looking at the, the growth management plan, I don't need to read your policies to you, but um, there's a lot in there about the public infrastructure and protecting our water resources and making sure that um, existing land and existing water is protected and reserved and that um, major subdivision development is done to areas that have the adequate infrastructure. Um, with our, as, as it has been said before, our Polcat Creek watershed is um, a class three protected watershed and According to the North Carolina Department of Water Quality, um, as I believe Ms. Hodierne was saying, the, this is a low density um, development. And um, although this, the uh, requirements for the low density is one dwelling unit per half acre, um, this plan is a little less than that. It's 0.41 dwelling units per acre. And, um, so if it were a little bit higher than that, it would meet the high density requirements, which um, have, has a stricter requirement for a stream buffer, which currently is set at 50 feet, but that would be a 100 foot stream buffer. Um, and as has been mentioned before, the HOA had a watering lawn requirement in there, but I believe that will be taken out now. Um, and as you have seen there, the Polcat uh, runoff in Polcat Creek, I've lived on Fred Lineberry Road most of my life, um, and it used to be a really rare occasion that Polcat flooded. Um, and now on the Providence Church Road side, it's every time it rains. And um, this property that this development will be on, most of it was clear cut this summer. Um, and so that has really caused, it doesn't even take, I mean, a few hours of steady rainfall and pull cats out of its banks. And there's been a handful of times in the last couple of years that it has almost come up to the Providence Church Road Bridge. So with added runoff, and if we continue to see the rain that we have been seeing, um, that may become an issue as far as uh, causing trouble to that bridge <clears throat> and the surrounding property owners that have their 
property mm -hmm. flooded every time it rains now. Um, let's see. Um, so going with, with what we have, I think, expressed a desire to see a little bit larger um, lot sizes, maybe um, a little less dense area, um, slight tiny little compromises can go a long way and really don't, maybe won't um, cause too much detriment to the developers or builders. Um, even going down to, um, oh, in a, a water crit critical area, which is usually um, designated as being within a half mile to the reservoir water line, the minimum lot size is 80,000 square feet, which is um, a little over one and three quarters acres. Um, we are not in a water critical area, but with all of the water uh, concerns in the area, it might be beneficial to consider maybe moving a little more towards those requirements just to, to have the built-in safeguards. Um, Traffic, I know we've, we've talked a lot about that, but the, um, the traffic circle, the roundabout, was added to the Business 220 Providence Church Road intersection in 2015 based on safety concerns, traffic studies, and crash analysis. And um, DOT, I did get that information from them. That traffic study ended in 2013, um, was being considered for a traffic signal, but did not meet the volume. So that could be something um, that this added traffic with a subdivision may, may require them to look at again. Um, and this was actually before the Dollar General came in, so I'm sure that has increased traffic a little bit. Um, we've talked about NERMS and Providence Grove being listed as congested. Um, on the, oh, and as far as the formula for adjusting for COVID numbers, Something also to consider in this area is the large number of high school drivers. Um, that's, it's not only the quantity of, of traffic, but sometimes the quality. Um, and also on the Fred Limeberry entrance, I know there's been mentioned a turning lane. As far as safety, that doesn't really do much in, in my opinion that the entrance, which is there's a very small area that they have to access. Um, it's at the top of a hill in a blind curve. Um, so it will keep traffic from backing up, but as far as if you're turning left into the subdivision, there's people, oncoming traffic is coming up a hill in a blind curve. And same thing of coming out of that entrance. Um, yeah. And lastly, just reading some of the, and I know this isn't finalized yet, but some of the HOA um, restrictions seemed a little stringent for Randolph County. Um, just, you know, we're in the country and everybody wants to have, you know, nice presentable areas, um, but some, some seemed a little strict. Um, we do have a Dollar General that's less than a half a mile from this entrance, so we're not quite that fancy. Um, but so I'm I'm not sure what the review process would be for for those, but um, those those seemed a little a little stringent. Um, and lastly, I have this is a a personal, not really an issue, but a personal thing. Um, and I've actually been in contact with Ms. Hodierne and Mr. Horn about it, and I know they're sitting right behind me. Um, and so this is not intended to call anyone out. I just wanted to get this on the um, official record um, about having options for property owners that um, have land that connects to the subdivision. Um, I have communicated with them about a desire to possibly purchase land that borders our current property to um, act as a buffer zone to preserve the integrity of our property and the setup that we have, um, which will be diminished with um, the, the current plan. Um, have not gotten definitive answer um, from that yet, but just 
wants to know what, what the options would be, whether um, Ms. Hodierne had um, suggested a raw land purchase or as part of the subdivision being able to purchase multiple lots. Um, and like I said, this is not to, because um, they've both been very communicative, just nothing definite has been Ma reached you, yet. Ma'am, you need to wrap up your comments. Okay. We got some more folks that okay. need to speak tonight. All right, um, well, and that's, that was really the last thing. Um, and just what we were, mainly what we're looking for is just, we know that, that the developer and the builders want to, to maximize their benefit, um, but we just want to be sure it's done responsibly with our natural resources and our, our area. So thank, thank you. you, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Sir? Anyone else who wishes to speak? Ms. Hey, would you ask earlier if the cell tower was on the property? Uh, and I've, spoke, uh, I've been back and forth with uh, neighbors there, and that cell tower is actually on this property uh, as it is. Uh, and I think North State is the tower uh, owner. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak tonight? My name's Randall Bowman. I live at 668 Providence Church Road. And I built my house 25 years ago. And I, just for the record, uh, Richard's been a good neighbor. And 25 years ago when I built my house, he walked up to me and said, I bought all that land behind you. You ain't gotta worry about anybody building behind you. Well, I know times change. But if he was still going to be here 25 more years, he wouldn't allow that to happen. That's why he bought it. So nobody built around him. But somehow or another, it's happening to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Anyone else who wishes to speak? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, I'm Debbie Bowman. I reside at 668 Providence Church Road. I'm also a representative of 642 Providence Church Road in combination 17 acres there. Our southern line uh, is, joins the uh, owner's property. Um, I just want to reiterate, um, as I spoke to, to Brian at the neighborhood meeting, I request that prospective homeowners have the option to purchase more than one lot. It sounds like they're considering that now. It wasn't at the be in the beginning. My na uh, the neighbors, the immediate neighbors around us, three, five acres or more. So these lots are not coherent with what our neighborhood is. I've lived on this property for 39 years. Um, it was family owned, it was family owned farm. So I do have some sentimental, va uh, sentimental value to this property. I'm concerned about the traffic. Um, I'm farther, I'm down from the, I'm to the east of the opening of this subdivision. So I've probably won't be affected as much, but I am very concerned about the traffic uh, on, this, on this road. We live on the straightaway. There have been multiple accidents in front of our home. I think it's, it's one of the passing zones on that road. Um, we're a mile off 220, but I'm, I'm very concerned. Uh, once I got over the shock of um, this proposal, um, then I began to think about how it was going to affect me. Um, but I just want to reiterate, I, would, I think it would be more cohesive to our neighborhood if the lots were larger size. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I did ask, and they said maybe some 3,000 square foot houses, a larger lot is going to 
going to be a, an issue, I think. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Anyone else who wishes to speak tonight? I'm Dan Leonard. Um, I reside at 5346 Fred Limeberry Road. Our driveway is directly across from the main entrance of the Victory Junction camp. Uh, we just, my wife and I, just retired and moved down here. Built a house on an existing lot which had existing well and septic. Uh, moved next to our uh, daughter's property. Uh, my biggest concern, as well as uh, most of the community around, is the, uh, the well system, water system. Uh, and I understood that they had an option of uh, hooking to city water, um, this development. And I don't know who come up with the idea that it's more cost effective to drill wells uh, regardless of the rest of the community. Um, there are concerns. And my question to you as a planning committee is, are our voices just a futile attempt to uh, protect our homes, our living uh, the way it is now? Or uh, we, I don't think anybody's come up with an amount of money to hire a lawyer uh, to fight this. Um, I just, uh, it's just my concern whether you as a committee is gonna take our voices seriously and uh, some of these issues that have been brought up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Anyone else who wishes to speak? Hi, I'm Teresa Evans, Ward Law. Uh, my grandfather owned the land across from Petty's long before I was born. So I kind of grew up there, currently live across the street. My driveway is almost directly across from the Petty Gate. My house is not that far from the road. Maybe, I'm gonna guess, 130 feet. So if they put these turn-in lanes in, I'm assuming that we're gonna lose some yards. And my parents live the next driveway to the east from where I'm at. And the traffic concern is real. I use my turn signals, I drive safely, but when I'm turning into my driveway, there's been times y'all must get rear-ended. The same things happen to my parents. It's not going to improve with this. And I just would like someone to get with me and let me know what is going to happen with our front yards on those entrances. Thank you. Did you say you live, or do you live on the north side of Providence, Providence Church Road? Or? Um, it's 509 Providence Church Road. But you said you live across the road from... From the, the Richard Petty Gate, my driveway is almost directly right. across from it. My parents are the next driveway down. And we already see problems with traffic. Is, is the... Well, go, yes, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Dawn Stanley. I live at 6048 Racine Road. Um, this, w we've, we've talked about this, the traffic. Um, there are mornings whenever the school was in that, like my husband said, in the morning, a lot of times you were about run over when I'm trying to come out of my driveway. 
there is a curve that is, is uh, down below us. And even though the, the, the speed limit is posted for 35, literally they do not pay any attention to that and they barrel through there. There's a stop sign probably 200 yards in, in, on to, the, to the right of us. And um, there have been accidents where they have just blown through that intersection um, on numerous occasions. <clears throat> Some of them reported, and I'm some, sure some of them, they just limped their car on home. Uh, but if there's 211 homes, even if you do an average of, of, say, like two children to a household, and you're only doing 175 homes, that's 350 kids. So that they got to go someplace. Now, no, all of them probably won't be driving, uh, but that, that definitely could... Uh, be a, a factor of when they're driving. And of course, they're gonna be going straight down Racine to Providence Grove School. Uh, there have been numerous times that I've seen the state troopers parking on Racine, catching those students that were flying up and down the road, uh, really trying to prevent um, accidents from these, these guys because the roads are narrow. Uh, a lot of times the shoulders drop off. Um, the, the creek down there at the bottom, of course, they have widened out the, the bridge some, but certainly it is a dangerous area for these. Uh, so uh, I do think all those things need to be uh, taken into consideration with the, um, the amount of, of homes that have, have been projected. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? My name's Beth Smith. I live at 5608 Fred Mary Road, and I'll be quick. I'll say ditto to everything everybody else has said, but I also want to bring up the point of students and school buses, because when school was in pre-COVID, busing was an issue, bus capacity was an issue. Um, there seemed to be a problem every year when school started. My son was waiting for the bus. You know, there were lots of hiccups with that. So I have concerns about more students and busing to school. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm Ann Coble, and you've already heard from my daughter, so I'll make it real brief. My big thing is what the biggest thing for us, our driveway is a half a mile long. So traffic, yeah, it's going to be an issue, but we're way off the road. We're on the very back of the property, so we run right up against the land. My biggest concern is what offer, what, how are they going to um, allow home, our, what should I say, property owners right there on the edge is there any kind of option to purchase land so that we're not right on top of all those houses, in addition to all the other issues? Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Do you have, you want to respond? Thank you. Amanda Hodiern again on behalf of the applicant. Um, I think we've heard a lot of very astute and thoughtful commentary and, you know, as I sit back and listen to it and, I'm, you know, it, it really is um, the, the, the question of development and growth, it's about balance. And, and what is reasonable. You know, you guys know this, sitting up there doing your job, that, that's the ultimate question here. You know, are, is a subdivision of lots um, in a neighborhood or in an area that has a smattering of some, you know, some subdivisions. You can see those adjacent on the right-hand side of the screen, on the upper right-hand corner of the screen, a little bit off in the left of the screen. So you have, you have some subdivisions around that are very in keeping with what's proposed here. And then yes, you have a smattering of, you know, um, more, more scattered residential development that is on these larger lots. It's not in a subdivision. 
So yes, that, that's, a, that's a difference. This is a subdivision. There are some areas that aren't. Um, so the, the question becomes, what is the appropriate way to balance those two, those two options for housing for, for your citizens and your future citizens? Um, it, it also becomes about, is it, is it best to you know, um, have infrastructure in, in these areas of growth that would, would indicate a, a need for more lots? Um, to, to be a little more articulate about that, water and sewer cost a lot more money and therefore demand, demand more lot yield. Um, so as, as we looked at this plan, we, we did it a couple different ways. Um, we, we did do a water and sewer plan and that, that, that plan had close to 300 lots. And as we evaluated that um, with the area, with talking to folks, with talking with your staff, it, it became pretty obvious, um, you know, all the things we're hearing tonight, that's not gonna be in keeping with the area. That's not a reasonable way to introduce a subdivision to this area. Yes, it's a subdivision. Yes, these are platted lots in a, in a cohesive community, but what's the most reasonable way to do that? What's the most balanced approach? So we thought um, the best way to do that would be with a low density option rural design, meaning ribbon pavement, large lots, large setbacks. Um, you know, one, one acre lot is, is smaller than a four acre lot, yes. But in a subdivision, um, that, that's, a, that's a very good size lot. And that's, that's a lot size that you see in, in rural conservation design, especially when you couple it with, you know, over 35% of open space. So, you know, I think, I think it's, a, it's a give and a take there. Do you want the large lots and the more rural feel and in keeping with the way that it's around it, which is well and septic, or do you want to go, you know, go more innovative, go to go to the next level up, and maybe do those those higher infrastructure costs that, um, you know, just from a practicality standpoint, do drive do drive the need for probably smaller lots and and more of them. So when we looked at it, we did it we did it both ways. We also did a very traditional kind of. 80s or 90s subdivision design where you just plat out the whole thing and you don't utilize common open space. That, that was up around 400 lots. So we, we immediately didn't like that one either. Um, and plus that's just not an innovative type of design that your growth management plan called for. So that, that immediately was not an option that we felt like was the reasonable, was the balanced approach. Um, you know, I think that as, as part of that, that question that not only developers have to consider, but also you, your, your county has to consider your officials and um, you guys as officials and, and your staff is, you know, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we're meeting the safeguards? And you have processes and independent experts in place to do that. You, and the state does as well that, that you utilize and that you're, um, you know, you're, you're allowed to seek out that guidance and, and administer it. So that's the process we're going through. You know, this is not just um, a developer and outside hired, hired experts at the developer's cost saying, hey, here, do this, here's what works. You know, this, this is the best way to do it. We have to do that all within the context of your framework. You know, we, we come in, we meet with staff, we say, hey, does this seem reasonable here? What, what guidance would you give us? And, and we did, we learned about the um, growth management plan. We learned about the additional rural growth area around Victory Junction. That's why those lots are bigger, so that we meet that requirement. We learned about, hey, you know, probably some larger lots and less of them would be better. So that's one of the comments that steered us to this type of approach. Um, then we, you know, then we have to do the study, the traffic study. That goes to NCDOT for review, for comment, and we have to do what they say. That's not something we can give or can take or leave. That's something that if you want to develop, if you want to get the driveway permits, you know, you got to do it. The, uh, the drainage, the stormwater is the same thing. That's, that's a state controlled process that we have to meet. And that, you know, the state has already said, here are our critical areas, here are our watersheds, and here are some best management practices for how to preserve those. So when we come to you and say, hey, this is a low density development project design within the parameters of that term from the Division of Water Quality, that's not something that we've made up on an ad hoc whim on how to best do these things. That's utilizing the best management practices that our state and our state experts has said we should do. So I, I think that, <coughs> You know, you have to remember when you're trying to trying to uh, thread the needle and meet all the different requirements of 
what a development takes and what a community um, can accept and what's good for a community, the best thing you can do is rely on that expertise, that independent neutral expertise that's already been set out by your, your experts, uh, county experts, municipal experts, and, and state experts. So that, that's why we place a lot of, a lot of value and, and talk a lot about these traffic studies and these drainage studies that we've done. And I'll let, <clears throat> I'll let Jim and Cliff speak to both of those more. Um, you know, the compatibility, I think that as, as I look at this plan, the reason we put it on an aerial like this is so that you get a context of how it fits into the development scheme. And, and yes, it is a subdivision, but it is very much like the other subdivisions I see around it. And I think that's important. You know, to me, when, when a developer is, is putting something on paper and you're thinking, okay, is this, is this gonna be a good fit? Is this gonna be something that's feasible? I think that this picture you're looking at right now is the very first important test you have to pass. You know, does it jump out at you as just being completely incongruous with what you're looking at? Um, one of the gentlemen mentioned other developments that, that Diamondback is doing. And that's true, we've got other developments that have 6,000 square foot lots. We've got developments that have 3,800 square foot lots. Um, that's not appropriate here. You know, we would never bring that here and, and say, you know, this is a great place for that type of design. That's because we, we go through this process of trying to find the balanced, reasonable approach of, of what, type of, um, what type of community can fit in. Yes, it's going to be a change. Yes, it needs to meet all these stringent requirements that you and your experts set out. But um, if it's balanced and it's reasonable, then you know, I think that that becomes the question. Is, and is it a balanced and reasonable way to you know, let the property owner exercise <coughs> this next phase, next phase of his life that he's obviously chosen? You know, he's, he's owned this property, he's enjoyed it. We've heard a lot, of, um, a lot of great stories about what's happened on this property and what it's meant to he and his family. Um, you know, and now he's chosen to take a different path with it. So I think what we have to do, and, and we're asking for your help to, to do, is figure out what's the balanced and reasonable way to accommodate that. Um, so those are some high-level comments, and I'm gonna let um, the engineers speak to the, the technical issues. Jim. Good evening, Jim Chandler with the Timmons Group, and our office is at uh, 5410. Trinity Road in Raleigh, North Carolina, 27607. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. I'll talk about a couple of things. Um, could you, could you raise your speak up, please? Yeah, I forgot, kind of talk, sorry. Um, well, 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 we'll start with uh, creeks and wetlands. I mean, that's a process of delineation that's governed by the state and the core. We have professionally delineated those. We have had those agencies out to concur what are classified streams and wetlands, and of course they're now protected. Um, so any permits that we would have to get if we chose to impact those, I mean, those would be, you know, local, state, and federal permits we'll be achieving. Of course, they're gonna make us minimize and avoid to the extent practical, which I think the layout you see provides. Um, Seems like some clearing may have already happened, but I mean, we're not gonna be mass grading this site. I mean, it's a septic subdivision. So, I mean, if we, if we mass graded and mass cleared, we would be compromising those septic soils. So it's gonna be a county looking subdivision, 20 foot DOT roads uh, with roadside ditches. We're just gonna be clearing right of ways and drainage easements. So it's, and then they will look at lot clearing on an individual basis with the septic soils with lot fits, where the house plan goes. And I'm sure gonna be saving trees on lots as well. So there's no mass clearing as part of this. What else? Wells, um, I mean, we can never get ample information from Franklin, from the county to support that, you know, connection to that public water service was ample to sub the subdivision. I mean, that's something we could reconsider I mean, there was an option for on 40,000 square foot lots, individual wells, but this is a subdivision with homeowners association. So we looked at the community well system. Um, we're doing a lot in Wake County. <coughs> Got a cough. Um, so the, the, the circles on the well site, I mean, we're, we're still preliminary in that. Those haven't been drilled yet, not until we got past this process where we drill it. We pick multiple sites. The state has to come out and approve sites. So we normally 
like he's saying, two or three too close to each other. I mean, that stuff, if one doesn't pass, there's a, there's a site you can move forward to. Ow. Give me just a minute. Had a migraine all day. <laughs> it's getting the best of me right at the moment, so I apologize. Um, I mean, the well system is adopted by the state. We'll be following it. I mean, one, one well site will only support 49 lots. After you get to the 50th lot, you have to pick a second well site that's then interconnected. That allows you to get up to 199 lots. So with this one, that's the reason for needing the three well sites. And they will be interconnected. I mean, they'll be running the well drillers, the tests, to, um, you know, looking at all the forms of lead and pollutants. We may be doing treatment on site, above ground storage on site. I mean, that's an evolved process. Uh, ONUS is one, Aqua's one. Um, sounds like they were already willing to rule out irrigation taps. I'll let them confirm. That's part of their HOA docs, so there wouldn't be irrigation taps. I mean, they could still irrigate out of their primary system, but they'd be paying the water bill accordingly for doing so. Um, what else did I miss? I think were the main questions. Um, I might need you to help me more with some of the well, well details, but... Um, Speaking the mic. Yes, sir. Excuse me. So, to speak to some of the specific questions about the well that were raised, it actually is a metered system. Um, Mr. Dale mentioned from the beginning that, you know, it would be turned over to one of the private utility companies like Aqua or Heater Utilities, somebody like that. And what they do is when they build the well infrastructure, um, there's a pump on it and then it pumps into a reserve tank. And so once the reserve tank is depleted, then that's when it has to go down and pump again. So it's not constantly humming 24 hours. And what it does is it meters the usage as it comes out of that reserve tank and disperses it to all the households. And that's how they set their fee schedule. So they know what the HOA, know what to charge the HOA. So they're able to, to read that data and say, wow, you know, you're making our pumps run 50% more than any other neighborhood, your charges are going up. So that is actually a metered usage. And it, it also helps to manage that, um, manage the, you know, dispersion of all that effort so that you don't have a pump running meaning, meaninglessly and, you know, constantly pulling water up when you don't need it. So it, it's, it's something that's calibrated based on usage and charged based on, based on usage. Um, the other thing I would point out is that I, I talked to the to the groundwater supply at the state. Um, I talked to that engineer at length, and he was explaining to me that there are parts of the state where there are, are concerns, significant concerns about groundwater supply due to a fractured aquifer system and having, um, having drawdown issues, you know, at various parts of that aquifer based on a well that might be drilled in one location. That's, that's down east. That is not, I confirmed, that is not a situation we're in here. So. That, that's first and foremost, that, that's significant, that the state has not identified this aquifer system as one that is um, already susceptible and identified for, for low water usage. We talked about the recharge patterns and rates that are in place here. There's a monitoring well um, sited in this aquifer here in Randolph County. It's actually at the zoo site. And they monitor that well with, with daily data. And what they're able to do with that is, is track the infiltration and the recharge rate based on the water flow and the rainfall. So yes, of course, if there is a drought, that will affect all wells, um, regardless of this, if this subdivision happens or not. But what we can predict and what we do know is that you have an aquifer system that's healthy and functional and doing what it's supposed to do with rainfall and, and replete, um, repleting that water supply. Um, the third important point is that Going back to that concept, there's parts of the state where they do worry about wells and the, um, the prevalence of them. One of the management practices that they actually prescribe is to quit doing the individual shallow wells and go to the, the more community-based deeper wells because what that does is it taps into a whole different chamber of the aquifer 
when you have a deeper well, it doesn't first draw down the shallow chambers and then come to the deep part. It taps and pulls from that deep part of the aquifer that it's already into. Whereas your individual wells for your individual home sites are all in the more shallow part of the aquifer. So if we were to do 211 individual wells, that would be more of a significant threat to the, to the water table than a few community wells. Um, so that, that's actually a, a protocol that's not prescribed in this area, but that, that is actually a, a better management practice for, for well usage. Um, let's see, a couple of other questions that were about that. Somebody mentioned, could this be turned into a, a larger system that other neighborhoods in the future could tap onto? and therefore you know, have even more usage on it. Well, no, that this is a private utility that's owned by this HOA. So for it to be um, you know, usurped and, and used by another subdivision, that would have to be something that um, you know, the, the county or the city would have to come in and, and kind of take over that water system and outfit it with the water lines and the necessary infrastructure to make it have a broader footprint. And, and they would have to pay the HOA for the right to do that because the HOA is going to own this. They'll own this system and th they'll own the rights to it. So it's not something that can be easily um, converted to, to broader usage. So it's something that is, is very uh, finite and controllable and, and has a known, it's a, it's a known quantity and a known entity is what I would say about that. Sorry, I just didn't mean to right, interrupt you there. <laughs> Help me catch my Thank breath. You. Uh, and then the other thing I can recall was just impervious area. I mean, we're, you know, again, we're choosing uh, the low density option. Um, I, I think the one young lady got up and spoke. I mean, under low, de under low density, um, it, it, max density is two dwelling units per acre, and we're at one dwelling unit per acre, so we're less. I mean, we will be restricted to 24%. And it doesn't allow us to do curb and gutter, you know, and, and pipe drainage systems. We'll be using roadside swales, grass swales. Um, and of course, anywhere we discharge the buffers, I mean, diffuse flow, the state's going to require that as well from the stormwater side. All right. But I'd be glad to answer any more questions. And I think Jeff's going to get up and Jeff, Cliff, Je Jeff's his counterpart. Cliff's going to get up and talk a minute about traffic. Right. Thank you. We will close the public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said no. I think he was drafted. <laughs> Can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay. Cliff Lawson, a traffic engineer with Timmons Group, 5410 Trinity Road, Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, we uh, actually conducted a traffic study uh, for this project. Uh, I guess to kind of start off, uh, this traffic study was scoped with the NCDOT prior to um, completing the study. All of the methodology, all of the methodologies chosen and study area intersections, when did we conduct the counts, and all of that was agreed upon up front. So um, I think I saw some concerns regarding uh, study area intersections about particularly not looking at intersections along Providence Church Road. Um, again, we kind of looked at all the study area intersections that were required of us per NCDOT standards and through that scoping meeting that we held with them. Um, I think there was a question regarding school operations. Uh, typically issues such as traffic operations for schools that aren't handled through traffic studies like this. NCDOT has a MSTA section that specifically handles traffic operation issues for existing schools. Um, and that would be something that some of the issues that I, I've heard presented here, that's what that would fall <laughs> under. Um, they do schools all over the state that have existing issues, um, such as on-site queuing issues, or because it could be anything from a traffic operation issue on-site or maybe some off-site intersection issues as well. So um, again, this original study assumed 260 units. Um, and as you heard, we're down to 211 units, so we have less of a traffic impact now I think I heard one question regarding COVID restrictions. Again, uh, obviously when we're doing these studies over the past year, we have to kind of continue to do these studies even though we recognize that COVID restrictions are in place. So there was some agreed upon methodology where we would look at historical counts, comparing them to our 
uh, collected counts on the day that we uh, you know conducted those counts. And if we noticed a difference in like percent difference in volumes, we would grow our counts accordingly. And kind of what we've noticed was towards the beginning of the pandemic, there was a major difference in traffic volumes. But as the year kind of went on, we started noticing that where they weren't kind of up to pre-COVID levels, they were starting to approach pre-COVID levels, particularly in the uh, the PM and kind of to, to represent that we saw that there was about a 15% difference in counts when we compared our collected counts to the historic counts. So we grew our counts by 15, by roughly 15% to account for that. So I didn't know if, if, if you all had any additional questions, but I, I just wanted to make sure that I was addressing some of the, the questions that I heard from the public. Any other questions? I guess on, on Providence Church, it's 35 miles an hour mm -hmm. uh, near Racine uh, and then coming on out toward level pro, uh, to the BP out there. It's um, 55. Would, mm -hmm. I, I guess, would it be logical to think that that 35 mile per hour speed limit zone will be extended out? Um, it's kind of odd to have a 55 mile an hour by the, where this entrance is going to be on the north side and you drop back down to 35. Well, um, I really can't speak to that. That would be a decision that NCDOT would have to make since that's a facility that they own. I could definitely see kind of the, the benefit of maybe reducing that. Um, in front of the driveways, but again, that'll be something that they would determine, right. you know, kind of once, you know, they get into the driveway permitting process. All right, any other questions? Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right, we will close the public hearing and county commissioners will uh, consider the request that, as was brought to us. I, I would just like to, uh, maybe make a couple of comments myself relative to, to some, of, some of your concerns and comments that have been made tonight. Um, first, as far as this, this board um, taking this matter seriously, um, I don't think there's a question there when, when you look at the process that we go through. There's been a technical review committee, there's been a neighborhood committee, there's been a zoning board committee that met and considered this and made a decision, and now our board. So this process, it's gone through four processes to get to where we are right now relative to this issue. And all of the county standards and requirements at every point has been made. And it's, it's a matter also of, of public, the, the private sector, the, the landowner's right to his property. Um, and I've seen several of these things. I think Mr. Bean referenced what's going on in Jamestown right now. And it just so happens that that family, one of my very closest friends is his sister-in-law. And her husband died. He farmed it. And several hundred acres again. But they're putting four units on one acre of land with a 10-foot setback. And we're looking at 211 houses on 520 acres of land with open spaces that is looking at the rural areas. Um, every aspect of this development, we're, we're going through the zoning process and, and the homes are compatible with the other development in the area. As far as DOT, the state makes those decisions. The wells, uh, stream mitigation, uh, wetlands mitigation, all of those, as they disturb those acres, they have to get permits from the state of North Carolina to, to do that. There's still a lot of work that has to be done for this process, this project to go forward. And that's all a part of issues, that, that a lot of the issues that's been raised here tonight. But, and it comes back and I, I know, um, I look at things differently <laughs> than I did earlier on in my life, and, and you know, Mr. Petty's wife has passed away. Um, and I, I, it's back to the property owner's right to, to use their land and to try to, to um, sell it, use it as, 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 as they can be, as can be permitted. We go through this process, 
because things it might, it might turn out differently, but that's why we have this process. Um, so I just, I just wanted to, uh, to make those, those notations, but there's any number of issues that they have to do to, to make this uh, compatible and to make it meet all the, the requirements from all these other different agencies and departments that are involved in the process. Uh, speed limit, the state of North Carolina, the DOT will set the speed limit. Um, ingress, egress, return lanes, et cetera, those are all requirements. A lot of this is developer beware uh, because they have to meet them and they all come with a price tag too. So th those are things that we can consider and I, but I just want you to understand that we absolutely take this matter seriously. That's the reason we have the appeal process that's brought you here tonight. Um, and we have all the minutes, we have the notations from the technical review committee, we have the notes from the neighborhood committee meeting, we have all the minutes from the planning board meeting. And I, I suspect most of you were there for that meeting that night. Um, so those are all the things that, that that we look at, take into consideration, along with the comments that's been made here tonight, and I, I do, uh, I do suspect that that there will be some changes relative to comments that have been made here tonight. So, um, just want to say that, and I'll come back to the board now for anybody that wants to make comments, and uh, as we consider action on the request. So, the matter before us tonight is uh, to either approve or deny the appeal request from the planning board um, relative to this request for the Kings Ranch subdivision. I'd like to make a comment or two uh, from what I've heard tonight. Uh, I want to commend all of you folks. Um, you guys know I've been to probably more of these than anybody combined on the rest of the, of the dais. Uh, you guys should be commended, all of you. Uh, very, very uh, well thought out. Your processes are good and sound. Uh, you've behaved yourself, which, Hal, you know yourself. That hasn't always been the case. Uh, you've been you've been very presentable, and I, I the the um, no matter how this thing goes, um, you you should be commended, both the presenters and the folks that are in opposition. Um, I did I did hear, and I, at least I hope I heard uh, some folks saying, could we be considered to buy some adjoining land if we adjoin that? I hope you folks. Look at that and think about that. Consider that, um, because I could feel I could feel for some of you folks that might have owned or do own property close by, and all of a sudden here's this, and like, what am I going to do? Um, from my standpoint, I'd say consider it. Uh, give them a chance if you can see your way into it. Um, this is an investment. I know that, um, and uh, you're you're there to to uh, create your your investment. But uh, I, I would appeal to you that uh, that would help, I think, immensely with some of the folks who feel probably that they're trapped. I can't do anything. They're not going to sell it to me, so I, I don't I don't have anything else to do. Give that some some thought and consideration. Uh, both of you are both sides very well presented mr chairman absolutely um very thoughtful and uh i think uh i think uh this is tough uh folks <laughs> this, this kind of decision is a, a a tough decision and um um there there's good you've made good points on, on both sides so i commend you for that Any other comments? What's the pleasure of the board? For your comment um, <clears throat> about situations changing, 
I think about I think about Mr. Petty's family, and obviously none of them intend to live there. They would not be, he would not be selling this if his children intended to live there. So that means when he's gone, then if this is not the direction that you go now, then I, I mean, I'd be interested. It doesn't, it doesn't do a lot of good to look and try to predict what the future holds, but I'm thinking there'd be, you know, his, his heirs and what they would want to do. And you might be dealing with you know, if, if the land's divided up, you'd be dealing with, you know, all, each of them and what they want to do with their portion. Um, it could be done very differently. And I think none of us want to see um, a lot of change. We like what we have. But I think this appears to be a responsible use of the land. Um, I've talked with DOT personally, the one, the lady who went up and prepared the study. Um, I get the concerns about schools. I taught school. When I retired, I did some subbing and I taught in, taught in different schools during my career and traffic is what it is around schools. Now that doesn't mean it can't be changed, but it sounds to me like those traffic patterns need to be changed now, and that's not a DOT issue. That is a school issue, because I know in schools I've been in, we listened to complaints from parents and did some major changes about the way traffic was handled. So I see that as being more of a of a school issue, but it certainly is a valid one, and it needs to be brought to the attention of the leaders in those schools or um, the leadership of the county schools, if that continues to be a concern, because it's a very valid concern. Um, I do want to go back very quickly, just because I want to know the cell tower. Tell me about that. I knew there was a cell tower back in there. Yeah, we, we can show you on the, on the drawing right, right there. I can't understand you with the mask on, sorry. We, we can show you on the, on the drawing where it's at, uh, uh, as we know it. But it's not on this property. Yeah. Do you want to speak to the cell tower? No, oh, you can, you can, so they can see exactly. Put it, draw a circle around yeah. it, so and that way, if you pass it down, then they can see where it is. Thank you. What? Go ahead. Yeah, Chris Garn, I'm at 5716 Ponderosa. I look at the cell tower every day. I'm against Richard, and the tower is on his property. It's 100 by 100 because I was there when they built it, and his property comes on down another acre and a half. So the tower is surrounded with his property. But it's not on this property. Yes, sir. Not according to what he just drew. It's there. I worked for Richard for 41 years. I just got laid off. I know all the property there. Is that, all right. is that where it's at? Yeah, right there, right there. Let's this is a Ponder, it's right off of Ponderosa. So Ponderosa is coming up. Is that the road right here? Well, it's out. I mean, see, it's outside all that yeah, green they, space. We cut, we cut it out, and it, so it cuts out right here. Right there. This is a road right here, Ponderosa, right? It's <laughs> yeah, it's right here. It's right up beside Daryl Griffin's yeah, yes, house. It's outside anything they've got. 
Okay, folks. He does own a lot of property here, and we're not buying all of it. So it, it may be true it's, that he does own it, but I, it's not it a part does. of this property. That's my he point. It's it. not. Sold it. Whatever it might be, it might be on Richard's property, but it's not he on just, this property that he's selling. Yes. The, Thank the you. property's selling. He sold it to to um, North State. Yes, correct. But it's on the property. His property is surrounded. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Clarify that. It's not. It's not on this property. Not on this property. He sold it to North State Telephone. It's not on this property. That's correct. <coughs> That's correct. Okay. Supposed to be right here. Do you have anything? See it. It's outside the line. Yes. So then yes. you've got an easement that comes in off of Ponderosa to get yes. to it, and it's right. out. Yeah, it, shows, it shows what they own tax map. Okay. Commissioners, comments? It's on your area. Well, I mean, it, it's just one of those situations where, you know, there's, we seem like we always have water issues. Uh, it's kind of ironic. I always find the irony in some of these that uh, we're worried about not having enough water for the wells, and yet we're worried about flooding on the lower end. Uh, that's always the way it seems to be. <coughs> um, you know, I, I do have some concerns about the Fred Line barrier, the road there. Uh, the entrance is not in the best place. Um, but I don't know where else you, you could put that. Um, and again, that's going to be a DOT issue. But um, I do have concerns about that. Um, you know, it is, is, for the most part, it's consistent with what the rest of the neighborhood, there are other developments. And this would kind of fit in with that. So that's on the, that side of the ledger. Um, schools, uh, I, my daughter went to Providence Grove. I'm familiar with the area there. Um, and according to the schools, you know, the, the counts there would not impact. In fact, they're well under under capacity, uh, especially Providence Grove. Uh, NERMS maybe not not quite as much. Uh, that doesn't address the, the, the traffic issues around those schools, but they do have the, the capacity based on what the school board had submitted. So, um, you know, it's um, these. These developments are always tough uh, because you want to honor the, the wishes of the landowner, but you don't want to impact his neighbors uh, or her neighbors as, to any degree in which it's going to change the character of the neighborhood. So I, I empathize with the folks out there that uh, are concerned uh, with the additional traffic and whatnot. Um, you know, it's, it's, I hate zoning. <laughs> uh, that's that's I just nobody is ever happy uh, and nobody ever really wins um, yeah it's just one of those tough tough decisions with I, I pick on the folks on the planning board said you, know, you got one job and it's to keep it from coming to us and uh, <laughs> so uh, the tough ones come to us but that's that's why we're elected to, to deal with these things one, one thing I want to make clear that uh, we're talking about the school situation is that's the school board's responsibility, that they make sure that these kids go where they need to go and be assigned where they need to be assigned. That's their, that's their job. Um, and I understand that and I respect that. Uh, and from the standpoint of traffic, it's DOT's job. Uh, we don't we don't build the roads. I mean, it's one of those things that happens. Uh, they need they, they need to be responsible for what whatever uh, that level is that they have to acquire and uh, and uh, deal with what goes on from a standpoint of local activity. I will say that we had um, in a meeting with uh, Dr. Ganey a few uh, couple of weeks ago, 
uh, we knew this was, was coming, and so I asked him myself if there was space in those schools, and he said yes. There is space in the schools. So I know as parents, the parent side of me always likes that smaller class size, but um, he says there's plenty of space in those schools. Those are the reports that we have. And uh, the presence of more students can actually help the school to operate better. I do know that. Um, gosh. Let me, while you look at that, just, I, I don't know if y'all have seen this, but part, part of the, the, what we get uh, there is a public education impact. The current, the current capacity of Level Cross Elementary is 731 students. Current enrollment is 460. At Northeast Randolph Middle School, capacity is 732. Current membership is 518. At Province Grove High School, the capacity is 1,544 and the enrollment is 701. It's less than 50%. So we do, we do get that, and that comes straight from the public schools as a part of the, uh, the impacts that, that we see uh, in the process. So um, there's, there's plenty of classroom space in all of those schools that, that serve that area. Okay, and just for clarification, because some of the speakers brought this up a time or two, so apparently there's been some change in the thinking somewhere along the way. But people will be able to purchase more than one lot. Yes, we ask that. I think that, if I, can I speak to that? Sure. Yes. I don't know that it's changed along take, the way. Take your mask off. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't know that it's changed along the way so much as it's just a fluid, a, a fluid matter that it's, it's hard to nail down when we don't have that end user who actually is selling that commodity at the discussion with us right now. You know, the builders come in and they buy these lots as, as part of their inventory. And, and part of that might be to, to build a home on it. So, I, you know, I, I just am hesitant to speak for... I don't know if we'll end up with, you know, a team of builders or a builder that um, would be willing to sell a lot without building a home on it. So, you know, I think as a developer, of course, we'd be fine with it. Um, but, you know, to, to own a lot of land, buying separately, you know, um, separately fungible lots are, is probably not the most financially, you know, efficient way to do that. So that, that's my, that's why it's a fluid answer. But from the developer's perspective, of course, you know, because we, we develop the lots and then the builder takes it from there. But I, I'm just hesitant without that, that other party to that discussion here at the table. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't want to bring the cell tower back up. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I think it's on the property. Uh, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sure looks like a cell tower just north of lot 125 in our packet, just off the road there. Um, I don't know if that has any impact on yeah, what we're doing here, but that looks like it to me. But just for clarification's sake. It seems like it can't be on the property of North State. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, I don't know. Yeah. let me show you what I'm looking at. Well, it, well, there's a <laughs> circle around it where it's drawn and yeah. map, yeah. and it's circled and squared. It, it's it wouldn't change. Is it a, no, no, the, that circle for, or is that circle? No, it's a the big, one twenty five is a big circle tower. with a little square. So it, it wouldn't. It's different than the it's different than the well circles the way you have them is it? charted. Okay. But I, I don't know that it makes any difference. But it is in the yeah. what we're zoning. So, so yeah, since it since it's brought up, and I guess we we're unsure. Um, and the reason we're unsure is because we're not going to do anything with it. it. It's not something that we can undo. It, um, it does. Ha sounds like North State is the user of yeah, it. If North State owns it. That, exactly. We can't, can't, we do can't undo that. that. And they might have an easement on it, but either way, they're they're paying for it, and that's something that we wouldn't be able to undo. So that's why it's not part of our planned proposal. And um, you know, it's not. Right. 
it's not high on our radar, obviously, yeah. from this right. discussion. Right, I just want to clarify yeah. it was on Thank there. you for, looks yeah. Like it. So, and it looks like there's an easement that goes, yeah. that's drawn mm -hmm. in. Yeah. And that, that will stay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the pleasure of the board so we can move? Well, <clears throat> it's in my district. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've spent a lot of time up there. If it's going to be developed at some point in time, I like the fact that it doesn't sprawl. It goes between the two roads. It doesn't sprawl around. I like the green spaces in it. Um, if it's going to be developed, <clears throat> I feel a little more comfortable feeling like we've got responsible development. Because believe me, sitting up here, we have seen some things that ended up not being so responsible. In spite of what you ask people to do, if they don't do it, then you're constantly spending taxpayer money going after those people for not building a berm, for not doing things that they have said they will do. And the research I've done says that this company is responsible. They're reputable. I have to feel like that's part of the reason that Mr. Petty would consider selling to them. So I'm going to make the motion to approve the rezoning request to rezone the specified parcels on the rezoning application to the requested zoning district based upon the determination of consistency and findings of reasonableness and public interest statements that are included in the planning board agenda submitted during the rezoning presentation and as may be amended incorporated into the motion to be included in the minutes as well as the site plan with any and all agreed upon revisions also incorporated into the motion and that the request is also consistent with the Randolph County Growth Management Plan. Thank you, Commissioner Haywood. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. The seconder will have to read the same thing. I would second the motion to approve this rezoning request to rezone the specified, sorry, Dana, <laughs> parcel on the rezoning application to the requested zoning district based upon the determination of consistency and findings of reasonableness and public interest statements that are included in the planning board agenda submitted during the rezoning presentation and as may be amended, incorporated into the motion to be included in the minutes as well as the site plan or plans and any and all agreed upon revisions and also incorporated into the motion that the request is also consistent with the Randolph County Growth Management Plan. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion or questions on the motion? Hearing none, those in favor will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And it passes. Thank all of you for your participation tonight. And I think that something good and it's Commissioner Haywood has said, uh, I think Mr. Petty was careful who he sold it to. So thank all of you for participating and those of you at home. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We are adjourned. Thank you. I'm sorry, I think. <laughs> yeah.